This is the Tanfield Railway, and it's the oldest still working railway in the world. Hmm, brass bits. Proper fire. It's a steam engine. Oh, we all have a good steam engine, don't we? And if you're, say, from, from America, you're probably familiar with this sort of this piece of technology arriving and opening up the West. The steam engine, the steam locomotive and the railways, they all arrived as one developed package because, well, railways, steam engines, all part of the same technology, right? Trouble is, though, it's just not true. The steam engine came much, much later than the railway. What makes a railway isn't a steam engine, it's the rails. Now, the Stockton to Darlington Railway is famous as being the first railway in the world. No, it was the first steam passenger carrying railway in the world, perhaps, opening in 1825. But that's, that's many centuries after people had already been using railways in mine workings and the like. It was mainly industrial uses. And up here in the northeast, a lot of the development of the railways happened. So much so, in fact, that they were sometimes referred to as Newcastle Roads. Before wagons on wagon ways, there were wains. Uh, a wain specifically refers to something that's not running on, on rails, it's using the roads. Um, but wains were, uh, well, they were very efficient in that they could go anywhere, um, but unfortunately they couldn't carry very heavy loads and they weren't very good with steep inclines and you needed quite a lot of animals to pull them. So a typical wain carrying, uh, pulling coal might have two horses and two oxen. I'm not entirely sure why they had that combination. Is it that the oxen uh, uh, accounted for the, the skittishness of the horses in case anything went wrong? Anyway, but that was the standard load. And uh, that team could pull about 1,800 weight of coal in a wain. Uh, another problem being that the wains uh, would chew up the roads. Most of the roads, of course, were just dirt roads. They weren't metalled, and so they would just turn them into quagmires in the winter, and you'd end up having to go further and further around the quagmire and chewing up more and more land, and they were just a nuisance, frankly. But when the wagonways came along, they hugely increased the efficiency. A single horse could pull 4,200 weight on a wagonway. And when I say a wagonway, I just mean a, a wooden wagonway. So there's a, these are wooden rails on a, a wooden platform. Later again, when steel wheels are moving on steel rails, the efficiency went up again. But even going back to the wagonways, the pre-industrial revolution wagon whales, ways, uh, one industrialist, uh, he calculated that his profits would go up from 656 pounds a year, based on what he could pull by Wayne, to 6,000 and something pounds a year. And I've heard the whistle, the train is coming, and I'm going to get to ride it! So here we are in third class, and third class, no cushions, and no, no overhead racks, just a wooden bench and a sense of adventure. <laughs> And if you don't know the significance of this photograph, then you need to see the film Brief Encounter. It's a masterpiece. Now this is, of course, a steam railway familiar to all of those who have a train set at home or have watched the movies. But I want you to exercise your imaginations, dear viewers, and think back to a time when there were not steam engines to pull things, but instead everything was pulled by horses. This was once a wagon way. And the horses would pull coal, because that's what this is all about. It's about moving coal for the first mile uphill and then gravity would take over. The horses would just follow along and a man working the brake would make sure that it didn't run away because it would roll down at actually quite a steep incline towards the Tyne River for export. And this place exported a lot. This exported in fact so much coal that it dominated the coal market far afield, not just in Britain exporting to London and the like, but even as far as the Mediterranean. The story of the modern railway starts in Central Europe, uh, in that area you might know as Bohemia, that became the, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and parts of Germany. And there they developed something called the light nagel. Um, uh, literally, that is guide nail. Um, a light nagel was a, a wagon that was small enough for one man to move, like a wheelbarrow. 
uh, and we have pictures from the period. The, the first published uh, reference to them is in 1556, and we see mine workers moving them along, not to rails like this. This is before the light nagel has a different system. It had a, a flat um, wooden platform for ordinary wheels to roll over, but the platform had a slot down the middle and the nagel, the nail, was at the front of the cart and went down into that slot, a bit like a slot car racer, scale electrics if you like. And the, the, uh, the hund, as they were called, which means dog, apparently they, they made a dog-like noise as they went along, had two big wheels at the back, somewhere near the point of balance, and two much smaller wheels at the front, uh, so you could put it down and there would be the nagel at the front. So you would pick it up a bit like a wheelbarrow, and then you could, in the darkness of a mine, just shut your eyes and walk forwards and, and hum to yourself and drift off into your own reverie, uh, because through the darkness the nagel would guide you along the true path, and they were using this to take stuff out of mines. And this is what it was all about. Yes, this is coal. This was wealth, immense wealth. But to be rich, you had to be able to move this stuff. They tried moving it by canal, but their canals after a while fizzled out. They tried moving it by road, and actually after a while, uh, the road fizzles out. Yeah, the road came back when they invented the motor car, but for a while, roads largely fizzled out. They tried moving it by rail, and that worked. They still move it by rail today, and people got really rich, and immensely rich, and one of them, I'm afraid to say, was the baby-eating Bishop of Durham. If you go back in time, don't go back to medieval Durham, because it was ruled by the, the prince bishops, and they were just, just oh, frankly, uh, but that's perhaps a video for another day. We have here some railings. Now, did you know that there is actually a relationship between the word railing and railway? You see, in Shropshire, where a lot of the early mines that used railways uh, were, the word rail meant fence, and a railing was like a fence. Railings, this is like a fence, right? Now imagine a fence, a wooden one, turn it on its side, put it on the ground, and you've got something that looks an awful lot like a railway, haven't you? So the word railway actually originally meant fenceway. Um, right, so this is today a steam railway, but it was a wagon way. You can see in this stretch, it's, uh, it's got two parallel tracks, and they would have a number of these for passing places so that wagons could get past each other, because there were so many, they needed that. And in places, there were two tracks the whole way, or even three in places, triple lanes of tracks moving cart after cart. And the wagoners were paid three to four pence per mile, for the laden section of the journey. So when they're taking coal down to the river, they're doing, they're doing pretty well. But on the way up, they got paid nothing whatsoever. The return journey was free. And of course, the, the horse would have to pull all the way back up the hill again, depositing, as it did so, a certain amount of useful stuff, manure. But you know, the wagon, the wagon men couldn't use that, couldn't sell it, they didn't have the right. The owner of the wagon way had the right to collect all the manure. manure. Is that fair? This is a roughly 30-year-old reconstruction of what the original wagons on the wagonway of 1725 might have looked like. Uh, the reconstruction is not bang on, it's missing a few bits. For a start, there should really be a platform for me to stand on uh, and ride on the back of the wagon. So it would have been freewheeling in that direction, and I would have worked a brake on this side. Uh, in the early days, there was a brake just on one side. About a uh, century later, they realised that brakes on both sides is a pretty good idea. Um, this reconstructed brake clearly doesn't really show uh, how it would have been back in the day, because that, that's not going to stop any wheel. Um, but one problem they had was that uh, this is wood and the wheels are wood. And so if you do have a, a cart that starts getting away from you and you've got to put some, uh, some work in to really stop it, you get a huge amount of wood on wood friction here, which generates heat. And we do hear of fires, these things bursting into flame. Uh, they did, at the bottom of hills, quite often have a pond. Uh, one of the reasons was to stop the wheels from drying out and splitting, but also it was to cool them down after the ride down the hill. Uh, there's a, an opening in the bottom of it, and round on this side you can see two big clips. And uh, I'm not going to do it, but if you pull these out, those release the bars which hold the, uh, the, the bottom in place, and so that the hatches would open at the bottom, and all the coal in it would fall through. They would freewheel down the hill, down to the tyne, and they would go out along a, a, a jetty, which had a hole in the bottom, and they would drop 
the coal directly into boats that were called keels. They're quite uh, small-ish, modest size, quite uh, stocky boats. And the reason they didn't go straight into bigger boats is because between there and uh, South Shields, where they had to get to to put the, uh, uh, the coal onto the big ocean-going vessels, uh, there was the, the Tyne Bridge. And the Tyne Bridge, back in those days, had quite small arches, so they had to get the boats through that, and then they could get loaded onto big sailing colliers, the sort of thing that uh, Captain Cook used when he went exploring. Now, the wheels um, are flanged, so they, uh, they would go on the rail, so the rail would be uh, touching this part of, the, of the, uh, the, um, the wheel, and the flange on the inside would, would keep it in place. And so again, you've got wood rubbing against wood. Rails would last about five years, five inches by five inches square, made of oak, and uh, yeah, that's about the life of them. In the northeast of England, there were great reserves of coal, and many of them were conveniently close to the surface and easy to work, and close to the River Tyne, which was great. And going back as far as Bede's time, people were digging up coal and transporting it around the world and selling it for profit. The snag was, of course, that as time went by, the easiest to get to reserves of coal became exhausted, and so people had to go further and further inland, away from the River Tyne. Um, and the ideal would be to go sideways into a hill uh, and, and get into some coal seams that were self-draining. It was much more difficult to go down. It's more expensive, you have to build lifts and so forth, it's more dangerous, and then you get into flooding problems. And in the early days, they didn't have decent pumps for, for getting the water out. So going sideways into shallower uh, coal seams was, was better. But they had to go further and further from the Tyne, which meant greater and greater transport problems from the mine to the Tyne. So how do you solve that? Well, one way was to build the wagon ways. And uh, in this reconstruction, you can see wooden wheels with flanges. And five by five, these are called edge rails because the wheel is uh, going along the, the top edge here uh, of, the, of, the, of the rails. Uh, these would be about uh, six feet long and just, uh, just butted joins so that every six feet there'd be a kudunk, kudunk, kudunk. So they weren't the smoothest. Um, now, the flange, of course, keeps it on the rail. Uh, which is which is fine, but it's not the only way of doing it. Um, you could have an L-shaped piece of metal uh, called a, a plateway uh, on the on the on the boards on the on the flat surface on which the over which the the wagon rolls, and the the flanges, if you like, are not on the wheels but on the rails. That was another way of doing it, but that didn't come along until uh, until iron. Back in the days of wooden rails, this was the way they did it with flanges. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, with the, uh, the plate way, the L-shaped bits of metal, is that you could get a perfectly ordinary wagon that didn't have flanged wheels and then stick that onto the railway. As long as it was the right sort of width, that would go on. So a bit more multi-purpose. Anyway, um, the, this way of, of transporting coal was just getting going and uh, an engineer called Huntington Beaumont, who had been quite successful uh, building a Woolerton railway down near Nottingham, he came up here thinking, right, I shall do the same feat up here and I shall make a lot of money. He didn't. He in fact lost £30,000 trying to uh, introduce his new engineering uh, system to the northeast, but the local bigwigs stopped him. The guilds and the merchants who had the rights to, to transport things and sell things, they did not like this newcomer and they made life absolutely impossible for him. And the story goes that he rode home just with the clothes uh, on his back, his horse beneath him and presumably a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Down this cutting here was once a wagon way, and there shall be a wagon way again. And that's because it'll soon be the 300th anniversary. Yes, in 1725, this was when the, the bridge and this uh, wagon way was laid out. And in 2025, they're hoping to have a reconstruction built here so that we'll all see just how it was. So are you, are you very interested in railways then? Or well, you're not very interested in railways. Oh, I see. Well, in that case, I think I've got something for you.
Yes, well, if you are interested in railways, then uh, I think I do have something for you. But if you're not interested in railways, then uh, I almost certainly still do have something uh, for you because of the nature of my sponsor. My sponsor being Audible. And Audible is, you probably knew this already, the greatest collection of audio titles available anywhere. Uh, they've got uh, loads of audio books in all the genres, uh, not just uh, novels, but also self-help books and history books and teach yourself how to do a thing book. And there's the plus catalog which has loads more stuff like the like uh, podcasts and comedy shows and audible originals which are things that they have commissioned themselves uh, with some quite big star names involved for instance um, uh, there's this star person here and this one here uh, who I'll edit in later so I'll be, I'll be interested to find out who it is uh, and oh my goodness it's this famous person as well um, and you may be wondering, hey, yes, but can I be sure it's really for me? Well, how about taking advantage of a, a bargain offer? So what you have to do is go to www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige or text Lindy Beige to 500 500. Details appearing on your screen now. Even better, click the link in the description, which is much faster and easier. Uh, and then you'll see the offer, which is, to summarize, three months at 60% off, which works out as $5.95. And for that, you get uh, one audiobook per month, which you keep forever. It's yours. It, it, it belongs to you. You don't have to listen to it in that time. And you have unlimited access to the Audio Plus, uh, Audible Plus catalogue as well. So that'll be a bit fab. And then you can listen on your devices. Now, you may think that, you, but Lloyd, you're a video maker. Surely you should be advocating that we watch more videos. Well, I know for a fact that uh, at least a quarter of you are even now listening to me and not watching me at all. You've no idea what I look like, some of you. Um, and when you're, I don't know, driving a tank or whatever, it's just not convenient to be watching a screen. But if you've got your, your little uh, your, the ear things in and you can connect that in some way to a device, you know, these devices that, that you young folk have, and then you can listen away to your heart's content and uh, be multitasking and it's probably perfectly safe. So um, uh, why not take advantage of this offer? And uh, it's something that caught my eye after I typed in the obvious word, railways. Uh, it's, well, and I should say at this point that there are an awful lot of uh, novels with a railway theme or the word railway in the title, um, including a huge number of whodunits, uh, I noticed. So um, it makes you quite nervous to get on a train. But I think uh, it, it's because of the convenience of the genre. You want to narrow the, the field of suspects. Ah, Inspector, I am quite sure that the murderer must be one of these 14 people that we have already got to know on this particular carriage. Um, so I think that's probably uh, why that's the, the, the case. And I don't think you're very likely to get murdered on a train, really. I think it's quite rare. Uh, but as far as I can tell, you should really stay away from Jersey uh, or Oxford or Midsummer. For goodness sake, don't go there. The murder rate. Uh, anyway, um, uh, but I, you know me, I'm more interested in history. So I, I saw this book called Railway and the Raj, subtitled How the Age of Steam Transformed India. And I thought, ah, oh, yeah, this is something that I could get my teeth into and listen away to contentedly. Um, it, it, it's pretty impressive, really, that the, the, the British built such huge railways across such an enormous place as India, or India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, as it was then. Uh, and they finished the first major railway in 1853. Um, which is before an awful lot of countries that we today think of as advanced uh, in Europe uh, had railways. So, uh, yeah, they, uh, India got railways quite early and it made a huge difference to the place. And um, the author, he advances this interesting twin theses that sort of pull in different directions. One being that it was a great convenience for the British trying to run the subcontinent, uh, but also that uh, uh, it played its part, the railway, in uh, sowing the seeds for the independence movement. Um, anyway, Railway and the Raj, you could give that a go or choose any of the others. Audible. Static engines of the sorts that powered the factories of Britain. They drive a belt, that drives a shaft, that, that drives all the lathes and looms in the factories of the land. Diesel, gas, steam. It wasn't me. I was miles away. And it was a stupid place to have left it anyway. And it was broken when I found it. I went for a walk across this landscape that was once crisscrossed by many wagonways bringing coal from the many mines. 
The camera did not pick up how high this raised track was. The drop on one side of it was nearly 20 feet in places. So around me you see nature. This could be a nature reserve. Ah, oh, this wild wilderness of a landscape. No, n nothing of the kind. This was industrial until the 1960s. They were mining here and they were mining here uh, back in the days of horsepower and this uh, river beneath me was used for water power when they ran pumping stations and other engines here and then later when the steam engines came along there were steam pumps here and then electri electrical pumps in those days. This is overgrown now but this was an industrial landscape. I need, I need a stick to play poo sticks. Ahead of me here, more apparent wilderness. This great overgrown hill you see ahead of me is in fact artificial. This is Causey Embankment, and according to the historian Michael Lewis, this was the biggest engineering work since the days of the Romans in Britain. This was the engineering marvel of its age. It's about 300 feet long, and we reckon about 100 feet tall. And don't forget, this was achieved without any mechanical diggers, any cranes or anything the like. That This was guys with spades and wheelbarrows having to move every shovel load of soil one load at a time. Um, the amount of work is, is, a bit, is a bit staggering. And of course, this blocked the valley with its burn running along the bottom. So they had to build a culvert uh, to allow the water to flow through. Well, this is the top of the embankment and you can see that it's still in use today. This is a modern railway carrying modern trains, which are far heavier than the trains that this embankment was originally designed for. And this path where I'm standing was once where a second parallel set of rails ran along the top of the Causey embankment. This is Causey Arch, the engineering wonder of the day. It's 105 feet across and 80 feet up to the deck. Although I have to say from my vantage point, it looks like a lot more than 80 feet down there. And uh, this was for 30, over 30 years, the longest single span arch anywhere in Britain. And people came from miles around, well, just to marvel at it. Uh, now, one William Stukeley, uh, an antiquarian, in 1725 reported that he had seen an earlier bridge. Um, the evidence for this earlier bridge is extremely sketchy, but it seems uh, that there may have been one built here before that fell down and went, then was almost immediately replaced with this one at the princely cost of £2,252.16 shillings, one and three quarter pence. That's a countency for you. Anyway, we are told that one Ralph Wood, a stonemason involved in its construction, got so fearful that this would go the way of the first bridge, which may or may not have existed, that he hurled himself to his death. Uh, this is unlikely for a number of reasons. One, the possibility that there was no first bridge. Two, it's just generally unlikely, isn't it? And three, he collected his wages a couple of months later. This is the oldest railway bridge in the world, and the Tanfield Railway, of which it was a part, moved half of the entire output of the River Tyne, which is quite staggering. Now, uh, it operated for about 220 days a year back in, 17, uh, in the 1700s, and that's because sometimes it was too wet or too frosty to operate. Uh, the wagons uh, would be very difficult to break uh, if, if uh, th there was not enough friction to do so. Um, but in those 220 days, at peak times, they would get to the point where they were moving as many as one wagon load every 45 seconds, averaging about 930 loads a day. They shifted in every year about half a million tons of coal. This was not the start of the Industrial Revolution because this was 125 years before the Industrial Revolution, but this is part of setting the scene that made the Industrial Revolution possible. Here you see the bizarre path that the wagonway took, the embankment spanning the steep valley here and an enormous bridge spanning the valley again just a short distance away. Why did they select such a devilishly inconvenient route? I'm getting to that. And this bridge was the result of something that became known as the War of the Wagonways. Cue music!
The War of the Wagonways, uh, it wasn't exactly a real war, but there was certainly plenty of nastiness. It was a legal war and a ruthless economic war. Uh, there was sabotage, and this did lead to, lead to some fisticuffs. It took place between about 1700 and 1735, and towards the end there was a particularly intense decade. Um, now, there were things that people were fighting over called way leaves. You see, it's all very well to have a mine, great, but how do you get a wagon way to that mine to get all the stuff from the mine to market? You have to go across somebody's land. So you have to get permission, a way leave, to create a way across that land to the mine. And it was possible for someone to get tremendously rich. Oh, brilliant, I've, I've bought this great mine. And then for rivals to make sure that all the land rights that would uh, grant way leaves to that mine are impossible to get hold of. They used to sometimes pay what's called dead rent. That is, they would pay rent for some land which they had no intention whatsoever of using just to deny it to the enemy so they wouldn't be able to build their wagon way. Um, one wagon way, uh, built by the Wortleys, uh, was, was cut into two pieces and to, uh, by the enemy, and to get round it, this was built. So this came out of that war. This does not take the most optimum route to the mine, but it uses a route which uses common land. They didn't need way leaves, so they had to go a fair bit out of their way and go to an enormous expense to buy this uh, and build it, but it was the way around this, this, the problem created by this war that got, as I say, pretty ruthless. In the east, there was a, a cartel which came together, formed a grand alliance, uh, a binding contract that lasted 99 years, saying we are all going to pool our resources and, and beat those fiends from the west. Now, in the east, the, the eastern group, they wanted a, a cartel, and uh, they were for uh, restricting output so that they could keep the prices really high. Um, which you may say is just you know, appalling misuse of capitalism. Whereas in the West, um, the Clavelys, under Baron Clavely, who was, I suppose, quite literally a coal baron, uh, they wanted unfettered production and, and, and free prices, which you could say is, is an, another a, a, a example of rampant capitalism. So it was two types of capitalism battling it out. And in the end, it was the ones in the East that won. Uh, the, uh, the Baron himself became so stressed by everything that was happening, uh, having some of his property uh, uh, sabotaged by the enemy, uh, that he, uh, it, it is said, died of that stress. Uh, but uh, Lady Jane Claverley, his wife, then took up the mantle and it was around her banner that the Western group rallied. Um, so there you go, the Battle of the Wagonways. One tradition we are told of is that a wagon like this would be lined with tin and then filled with punch for all the workers to drink from to celebrate the completion of one of the wagonways. Right, let's talk about sleepers. Now in the early days the sleepers were wooden and this was fine apart from the fact that the horses of course would just keep tripping on all these sleepers that stand proud of the ground. But they had a solution for that. Simple enough, you get a load of ballast, a load of stones from wherever. There's an awful lot of industrial processes going about, so there's quite a lot of waste matter, and you could just shove it down and bury all the sleepers, creating this road for your horses to walk on. So, a wooden railway with wooden sleepers. It makes logical sense. But then they made iron and steel rails, and they thought, we need something a bit more stable. Uh, so they went over to stone, and they had big blocks of stone sunk deep into the earth, because these would be more rigid and more stable. Well, they were more rigid, but the trouble is that that was actually, it turned out, a drawback. Um, it made things um, wear out an awful lot quicker. What you want is the flex that wood gives you. So they then went back to wood. One way to move stuff is to pull it using a horse or oxen, and another one is, of course, to use a steam locomotive. But you might think of a steam engine as a locomotive. But, of course, a locomotive is a particular kind of steam engine. It's one that's on wheels that moves. But there's another way of doing it. You can have a static engine that is really just a giant winch hauling on a cable with the wagons on the end of that and pulling them up the incline uh, with steam power from a stationary place like this. I have come to see this winding house, so-called because it would be a winch, essentially. It's, it's winding in the cable. And there was one here, apparently. But with my trained archaeologist's eye, what I think I found is a lot of nettles and brambles. The first iron rails appeared in 1767. Um, and these aren't particularly old iron rails, but they're some of the oldest here. And you'll notice that they've got the a sort of curving underbelly. Uh, it was thought that this uh, was the most efficient way of bearing the stresses. For a long time, they could only make them in three foot lengths, which meant an awful lot of ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk in between the two, particularly as the early ones just had butt joints. 
Um, but then after a while, industrial might uh, grew and they could make things that were maybe 15, 18 feet long, but there's still a fair amount of ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Um, later, they came up with uh, overlapping joints to uh, lessen the impact between rails. Uh, but these iron rails didn't immediately supersede wooden ones. Wooden ones were used uh, off in the wilds of Canada amongst loggers, and actually even in Europe, well into the 19th century. This may look like one large piece of steel, but actually it's not. Uh, there's a cast section in the centre here, which comes out to about here, and then from here to the edge is what's known as the tyre, and this is a separate piece of steel. This would be heated up so it would expand and then it would be put over this cast section here and allowed to cool down and contract and as you can see it's achieved a very, very precise fit. Here we have a flanged wheel. You're probably familiar with this design. Modern railways with, with good stout steel wheels on steel rails, they use flanged wheels. And this particular design was uh, created by our George Stevenson. The design uh, refinement being that this is not a, a flat uh, surface here of consistent diameter. Instead, the wheel has a higher diameter close to the flange and slightly lesser one further away. And that means that less of this surface here is in contact with the rail beneath, which means that there's less friction and less drag. So that's good, and, and less wear. Great. Uh, unfortunately, when you come to brake, um, that can be a problem. Now, the brake itself, making contact with the wheel, as long as it's shaped very precisely, it can get a decent grip on the wheel. Uh, but the amount of grip that the wheel has on the rail is, of course, the ultimate limitation. And you might completely stop the wheel going round, might, might lock it up, and still a large train going at any speed will skid along the rails. Um, modern railways using steel wheels like this cannot cope with much of a gradient. Wagonways of old, on the other hand, could. That's a flipping spanner. Ah, lick a paint, it'd be fine. Moving back, you've got air into the system. Uh, that will, that will...